No Box Dance presents Dance Behind the Screen, Process Production and Social Media. Don't forget, say no to the box. Dile no a la caja, cuyo un gran amigo en Sanjaiza pasa de hell. Welcome back to Dance Behind the Screen podcast. This is your host, Marthea. In season six, our theme is dance and technology. Our goal this season is to talk about how dance can coexist in a world of screens, social media, and interactive technology. Today's guest is interactive media designer, my friend and collaborator, Joel Olivas. Welcome to our show, Joel. Hey, thanks for having me, Marthea. Excited to be here. Thank you. Joel, I have wanted to have you on the podcast for years. I have learned so much from you and have really loved working with you to create our works with Mixedemonis. Can you briefly introduce yourself and talk about your relationship with interactive media? Yeah, absolutely. So it, it was a culmination to when Mixedemonis came together. That was really a turning point for myself in the direction where I wanted to go with my creative background. I actually studied music in college originally. And when I was doing music, like guitar, I discovered electronic music, production and audio engineering and all that. But on top of that, there was another element, which was more like uh, programming music. So it was music composition, but using programming tools and not necessarily, not MIDI, but actual like code type of programming. It's called digital signal processing. And I took a course called electroacoustic composition at UNT. And that completely opened up a a world of possibilities that I looked and I saw, I was like, whoa, hang on. Anything that I can imagine, I can program and put together. When you're young and fresh in college, you think that you are going to solve the world's problems. And (laughs) as ambitious as I was, I didn't know a lot of what I was doing already. There was a whole field already dedicated to doing that. So really towards the end of college, I started to discover that field a little bit more. And that field was essentially... Uh, the immersive and interactive multimedia space. And I'm just going through life as a artist, as a musician, and then discovering more of that tech art. I got into AV production to pay my bills. A lot of corporate events, a lot of projection mapping for just uh, galas and events that would pay my bills. And slowly and surely, I built a lot of experience in the production realm that I was able to then use my creative background and my logistical experience in production and events and put those together. Well, Joel, I would love to talk about your different experiences with interactive media across many landscapes, like you were talking about, from really low budget, like Mixed Emotis getting started, <laughs> to some <laughs> of your other projects, like working with Meow Wolf or Art Tech House, even at CES. So can you talk about your role with maybe one of your favorite organizations that you've worked with and what would be similar working with maybe a smaller budget organization to then a larger budget organization? That's funny because the process requires you to start. You don't. You never start at the top. Like you don't, you're not going to get hired by the the top dogs in any industry with zero experience or even minimal experience. And so really one of my favorite groups has been Mixed Emotives to work with because not only am I one of the leaders and we get to, I implement my ideas into it. It's like responsibility that's put on me to execute this. And so that when you take ownership of what you do, that is truly one of the most like, important experience building things you can do for yourself. And essentially, it was because of Mixed Emotis that enabled me and validated me to go work for Art Tech House, which then led to a another collaboration with the Dallas Symphony Orchestra, which then led to Meow Wolf Grapevine, which led to CES. And so it's like a chain of events. And it always starts small. It always starts with the low budget things. And with Mixed Emotis, we were fortunate, honestly, really fortunate that because of the time that was fresh out of COVID, we were able to source all the equipment for such a low price that that budget worked out. And you worked your magic, Martha, with your grant writing and <laughs> and just how you do things. You you have your ish together. It's Very been, sweet, Joel. It's, Thank it's you. It's been great to have somebody supporting that 
project because these projects are not one, they're not a one person show. It's never, you go crazy. I, I went a little crazy sometimes handling so many things like to handle both the creative and the technical aspects of the projection mapping process is a lot of work. And I would not have been able to do that without your support in like funding and logistics. And even when it comes down to having snacks for us like <laughs> during their setup days and, and our rehearsal days, like uh, those, all those little things and, and the team that you work with are really vital to help you grow to that. But I can't emphasize how important it is to go for those small budget opportunities because as much as I hate to say it, but sometimes the exposure is worth it, especially if what you do is something that's really cool and you, you are doing something that nobody else in town is doing, like what we did. Nobody else in Dallas has been doing what Mixed Modus has been doing, but for, for as far as I've seen. Uh, of course, in the East Coast and West Coast, there's next level stuff going on out there. But in Texas, we definitely were doing something unique uh, locally. And so when there's an opportunity to do something unique and something cool, it's, I would say, especially if you don't have that, like, stuff in your portfolio, go for it. It's always going to be worth it to push boundaries and, and to get better and do something really cool. Because now, guess what? Your portfolio, like the, the cooler that looks, the more validation you have for when people with the big budgets look at you and say, hey, this guy knows how to do these things. Okay, we can likely trust them because not everybody can do this. So if he's already executing at this level, more than likely he can work with us with much less responsibilities because they have all their people in there. With our tech house, I just had one role was the system integration and interactive programming. It was basically me managing the AV teams and telling them, hey, this needs to go like that. And then I would come in after they do all the physical work. I just do optimization and calibration for sensors. Then the creative team with our tech house, then me, me I communicate with them. Essentially, I'm just like the bridge between the creative and the technical. And so my experience of handling both creative and technical with Mixed and Modus was the most, it, it was the, the perfect recipe really to, for success that I ended up discovering with all of these multimedia projects. So I know, love hearing that, it's Joel. So great. <laughs> and it just makes me so grateful for the collaboration that we've created with Reina and you and just like the work that we continue to create and to hear kind of the like long lasting effects that it's had on your career. I feel like we always are talking about like more personal effects it has on us and our artistry, but it's really cool to hear how it's affected the trajectory of your career. And it makes me really curious. You've had different experiences creating these types of immersive installations and you've played many different roles in those types of creative processes. So I'm wondering, what do you think are the components of a successful immersive installation? I'm going to make it convoluted because it depends on what your goal is. I don't say I'm like a, entirely a goal-driven person. I'm more of like a system-driven person. But there's two, two approaches to all these projects. You can think as a designer or you think as an artist. It just depends. Oh. The best art always comes from the artist's own intuition and never think about what anybody is going to say, judge, or criticize. Like You don't create art for somebody else. So you really have to think like the best thing that you're going to ever create is what you think is the best thing that comes out of you because that's from yourself. And so following your own intuition and not keeping others' approval in mind is really the best thing way to really create in general. And so I found that with Mixed Modus, that was my best way to really tap into that. I'm going to do what I think is really cool. And I'm so thankful. Again, back to you, Martha, like you really encouraged my creativity in that, hey, just take it where you want to. But in that mindset, I did what I wanted, what I thought was going to be cool. And I never thought about, oh, this person's going to like it or not, or, or hope they like it or hope they don't like it. It's I find that thinking more as a designer. So then once you go into the design thinking, that's when you have a client, somebody's paying you to do something. And then that client has their own business goals to essentially accomplish. So it's okay, they have an audience. And so 
when you're going into design thinking, now you have a target audience. Now you're kind of, now you're thinking like, you're thinking backwards. So not like in a negative way, but it's here's the end user and you basically reverse engineer how to, what the design, like the experience for this end user, right? Who are they? What do they want? What does the sponsor, what does the client want them to experience? And let's, then you reverse think all that versus when it's just art, it's a flow. It's, oh man, you, it's a discovery process. It's a, it's definitely freer. And I love, I prefer doing art projects, but you don't always pay the bills, at least not yet. I would love to be a very successful artist. Yet I also enjoy the big budget productions that I get paid as a designer. I hope that answers the question, but it's, it is like a designer thinking and then artist thinking, and, and they are different processes. Yeah, I appreciate you differentiating between the two. Create, discuss, and advocate for art. No box dance. I'm wondering, how are you thinking about the audience or the participants when you're creating? So whether that's for a client or with mixed emotives. Yeah, I use myself as a as the audience. If I'm sitting somewhere and I'm like I'm looking at something, and it does take a lot of forethought. Like, how do I feel? Because at the end of the day, I don't think we know. You don't know what other people think or feel at a time. So the best gauge that I believe is the way to go about it is you put yourself in that situation, and you're like, okay, if I'm experiencing a show or if I'm experiencing something here, what's something that is going to create what's something that i would want to see what's something that inspires me and and a lot of times that just comes to okay what have i seen in the past that i think is cool yeah i I just and then i think that does touch on the whole thing that's going wrong with hollywood is everything's focus group driven movies aren't made the same anymore because it's always like rehashes of proven things that have worked in the past and and doing all like data based idea creation and i'm just like and i don't I really don't think that is the way to really create something that is genuine, innovative, and a good experience for people because you're just using the same old stuff that has happened before. And to go back to how I was saying, when you're an artist's way of thinking is you don't keep in, you you don't people please when you're in the creative process. I'm trying to like please myself. I'm trying to put myself in the shoes where it's like, hey, if I'm here, what do I think is going to be cool? Because I'm already involved in this space so much. What I think is going to be cool is a more, let's say, experienced palette of what people that have never experienced these sort of installations are going to have. And it's think of a sommelier, sommelier, a wine professional. It's okay. Are you going to pick a wine if you're not even a wine drinker and you just get Trader Joe's wine all the time? You go to a restaurant and it's your experience as a restaurant. Oh, you got all these picks here. Are you going to take the sommelier's experience like with your wine pairing or are you going to just go off on your own off of your Trader Joe like knowledge, right? Not to dig on, not to dog on Trader Joe's wine because it's still fine wine, <laughs> but it's just that, hey, trust your. I trust my own experience and the experience of others around me with the same amount of um, knowledge and exposure to high art installations. And my judgment for this particular experience, like type of thinking is going to be a solid, like good judgment because I've I've been in it. So it it all goes back to trusting yourself and, and being like putting yourself in that audience seat. Right. I'm really glad I asked that question because hearing your answer reminded me about like the importance, I guess, of confidence when making art and putting yourself out there. And I feel like when it comes, I felt like when making art, like in school, uh, there was more like permission, I guess, to be like playful because to me, it felt like the stakes were less. I mean, you were paying to go to school. And so you didn't really have to worry about making sure the audience was full and paying the creative team and things like that. And I feel like, personally, I feel like I've been struggling with this like challenge of negotiating, trusting my own voice and my confidence while also navigating paying people and keeping things moving forward. 
And so I guess I'm asking, do you have advice because of your experience working for such larger organizations, how it seems like you're able to model this confidence, but like, how are they navigating the field when they already have all of the resources? That is that is more one of those, not to sound like a self-help book, but there's a lot of elements of confidence. You nailed it right on the head. It is it is really a, all about confidence and the grit to push through those difficult things. I can't tell you how many times I've done things that nobody showed up at. And it can be pretty heartbreaking, especially like in school and put some shows together. And honestly, like you had two or three people show up, like it, it can be very defeating motivationally wise. And, and I did struggle for a while to build that confidence. I personally found myself more confident through doing a lot of building my health, exercise, good diet, lots of water, cut back on the drinking that that helped. Even though my you're confidence. promoting Trader Wine, <laughs> Trader Joe's it's, Wine. Hey, it's like a wine a day. Or I'm not even saying that. It's just <laughs> There's a difference between having a glass of wine with your dinner and then just going out to the bar and with and, and just drinking every night like tequila. There's a big, big I difference know. in I'm that. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it really it's just grit, and you really have to to lead your own projects is not easy at all, and that is the differentiating factor of okay, do you want to lead your own projects and and knowing like what you're signing up for, because if you want to do your own thing. Guess you're going to be, you need to really have a lot of willpower and you really got to have that desire to go through all of the unpleasant things like the rejection, the, all the extra amount of work that you have to do with promotion marketing. And then you have, it's, it is a mental strength thing, I, I believe. And if that's not somebody that you can identify as like this, like super motivated and just you're taking punches left and like beat downs left and right on on and you can go forward without the validation eventually you'll get the validation but you got to just really iron through hardship to get to that at least that's been my experience yeah and i feel like that definitely speaks to knowing your own internal values on which direction that you want to go i think that personally both avenues are enticing and rewarding it yeah. just depends on where you're at, even in your life. Different chapters might require different things from you. I certainly see so much value in in the past, like dancing for other companies and getting to learn from their years of experience and connections to different venues and things like that compared to the process now with Mixed Motors being more of an entrepreneurial approach to sourcing our own funding and support and marketing, like you mentioned. Yeah, and, and that brings up another point is cannot undervalue the value of working for other people with more experience than that are have been doing it. Like I learned my my skill set and my knowledge and my ability and confidence skyrocketed after a, the first time I worked for our tech house. It opened up an entire just things that I have never seen done at a scale, like things that I've always studied and just, oh, man, this would be cool. But I never actually saw executed at a large scale commercial level. And that completely and then not just that, all the people that I met through their experience, all the excellent amount of people that I got to work with and work for. I learned so much from them. And so that's that just comes down to it is yeah maybe I, I know i put myself through potentially more difficult times than i needed to at times just out of say ego or just like flat out stubbornness of like, i'm gonna do it yeah but really the real value comes from learning and the best way to learn is to learn with excellent people who are really good at what they do in my research for the interview and of course, watching all of your amazing videos on Instagram and in text message and things like that. Our Tech House, Mixed and Matters, and No Box Dance really have this shared mission of pushing boundaries of what is possible. And I wonder what boundaries do you think need to be pushed when it comes to art making in the interactive media space? That's a good question, man. I do think that interaction and sensory stimulation can definitely 
be explored a little bit more. I know everything's like, oh, AI, AI, this and all that stuff, but it's that's just AI doing the work for you. I think that whole thing, like the AI thing will go its own direction, but we're still human. We're still here. Singularity hasn't happened yet. Like <laughs> we're around still integrating more senses and more engagement just like interactively would be great. One great example that someone, probably the closest, the coolest pushing of that boundary so far that I have seen that it's going in that direction is actually the sphere in Las Vegas. Not, And it's not actually about the whole scale of everything. I got to go see a show there, fortunately, like in January while I was in Vegas for CES. I'm uh, so client, jealous. Client had bought a whole <laughs> private booth like for the, the whole suite there. So got a really cool view about everything. But what was particularly pushing on boundaries on what I saw as far as sensory was um, the the seats at the sphere would vibrate. They had built-in vibrations with that would synchronize with the like content and the sound of the screen. So, for example, it was a postcard from Earth is what we saw, which is the film that they show when U2 is not playing. There's a scene with an elephant that like walks up to it. It's huge. And every time it stomps, your seat shakes so you're feeling it's yeah you feel that it, it basically it just bridges that gap between the digital and the physical more so the more we can physically emulate the digital i think the more we are able to push those interactive boundaries right they also had another they had fans at the bottom that were scented scenes where you would actually fly from earth into space into the into mount everest uh, all of a sudden it's like you get hit by a wind of a gust of wind and it smells like mountain it smells like snow it smells like clouds and then you go into like jungle and then it smells like jungly and smells like or when it's thunderstorming it smells like wet dirt it's just like the smell i was i was so amazed the city i think i guess they didn't go with the sewer smelling but <laughs> <laughs> uh, which is a good call but even yeah just all the environments that they would switch to not every single time, but often here and there, they, they were they chose great moments to implement those senses, right? That sensory stimulation. And it was a great balance of stimulation overload and then just just letting it cruise. And I do think that the more senses you stimulate, the the more heightened the experience of whatever you create is. You are listening to Novox Dance. What do you think are some of the trends that you're seeing in interactive media right now? We're in 2024. Hmm. Oh, man, that one's it's funny because I am I do feel like it's there's a curve of like innovation per se. And we definitely with GPU processing everything. So that curve of the innovation with like sensors and stuff like that, like when it first hit, it just was like, oh man, we can now get screens and projection mapping to interact with people oh, it's huge at that point i think it's starting to that slope is starting to lessen a little bit so now we're kind of instead of going oh my god it's like huge innovation now it's okay we're at a, a certain incremental adaptation to that one example was with like interactive floors the nba recently like this past weekend they debuted a really cool full-size led court that would track players. This was for the NBA celebrity all-star game. So I think they did a really good call and they did built this whole court that would do all these cool animations and so would actually like track the players where they would be running around and, and do like animations where they were running. It's not as cool basketball. It's like the basketball game itself isn't as good as NBA players. So they definitely did, I think was genius that they brought in that interactive LED uh, court to make up for the crappy basketball <laughs> of the <laughs> celebrities. And it just kept me engaged. Like, I would not have watched that game um, if it weren't for that. Joel, did, with the NFL this year, I think I can only think of two examples, but I know there was one game that was like, maybe I think it was in London or something like that. And like, it looked like it was Andy's room in Toy Story. And oh, then, yeah. And then more recently, it was like a Nickelodeon partnership or something. Because like when they went into the end zone. Oh, you're talking about the Super Bowl, right? Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the Super Bowl. The, the big the, ones. Yeah. Into the like end zone, right? And then it was like slime and stuff. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like so with those uh, types of like animations overlaying on what's happening live. So I would say that definitely that's like augmented reality. And then you have the the Apple Vision Pro, right? That new headset that they're coming out with where now you can basically it's like Iron Man, but you can put holographic stuff that you can see in there. And all that interaction, it's it is the barrier to entry is a little higher for that still. Yeah, um, it's so expensive. So, <laughs> It's very expensive. And I guess once we that those sort of things are definitely more like individual experiences versus, I don't know, in physical in person sort of things, because it's with like the with the sports stuff, they definitely are able to do more things that you can only see on the TV. The Apple Pro things, unless everybody has the same like goggle, if, unless everybody has one in the same room and they sync up all together, then you can experience something collectively. So there's. I feel like maybe that curve of innovation that I'm talking about, it's more just, it's maybe not so much like a curve, like going up or down, but it's like branching out. So now you have, oh, ways to create interactive interactivity with a multimedia spectrum. It's okay. You can either put a camera on something and then projection map it, or you can put on like the headsets. Now you have augmented reality, virtual reality. There's just so many ways to go through it and then they're just it is just phenomenal as a concept i think how we as humans have utilized light as such a powerful mode of interactivity and experience we are visual creatures right and so it, it is just really one of the limitations of lights <laughs> that's where it will come down to i don't think we'll ever stop um, innovating and creating new ways to experience something although currently like trends that i see is just going to be more of like augmented reality is probably going to be taking off a lot more because of apple and because of like other like like show tv programs that the nfl doing what they did is going to have a strong ripple effect in broadcasting from now on rogers innovation adoption curve is essentially where in that curve, like all what we're seeing in the big mainstream stuff is already at the latest early majority. Um, a lot of these like innovation things that are probably things we haven't seen yet that are done by the innovators and early adopters. It's a lot of experimental stuff going out there, but a lot of it is still, I personally feel like it's still like the same tech. It's just improved. I haven't really seen anything that's like really like crazy innovative other than the obvious project progression of augmented reality so now we have mixed reality Au augmented mixed reality the same thing where you have glass you have the the headset that you can still see the rest of the world but and you can add digital elements on there i think that's the closest thing to innovation that we are currently experiencing with actual like technology being developed but at a, at a certain point, what more can you do with like an interactive projection? It, that's more of a creative like content and art driven question and less technology capability wise. That's a great perspective. So. And Joel, I know you've created a new venture. So I'm wondering if you can talk about your new venture, Amused. It is a I mean, immersive and interactive multimedia production studio. Amuse Studio is my new business that is has unofficially launched. It is the website's getting done. I'll be finishing it pretty soon myself. And that is going to be essentially a studio that also collaborates with many event planners and creative directors and just pretty much anybody that wants to build something technology-centered. All the things that you want to do in person that needs to be technology based. Like I've found myself as that bridge, and Amuse is the studio that will be collaborative and supportive with several like event event planners, technical directors, producers, creative directors. Really, it's just about you want, we need to produce a installation. There's so many elements on that and amuse is going to be one of those elements in dallas that can absolutely 
you know, make some innovative and challenging projects happen. Well, Joel, I'm so proud of you. And just, I feel like when we met back in, what was it, like 2019, 2020, it's really been such a pleasure to see how much you've grown as a person and just as a creative. And I really cherish our friendship. And I'm really glad that you came on the podcast today. And to wrap this up, we have our final two segments. So we have our questions from the No Box Dance Archive. Do you think social media is influencing the dance world? And if so, how does it influence your work? It's a thousand percent influencing everything. And I've only recently started to realize (laughs) how important social media is for anybody in the creative space. All of these projects that I got was because of social media. Like CES happened. I met somebody at a bar that referred me to their boss, but then I've only received that validation from that referral because they saw me and what I was doing on social media over like the year and a half that we had met. So I'd met this person over a year and a half passed by and then she referred me to her boss because she saw me with all the progress that I had been doing over the like the year. And so once because of that, it's it is so fast paced though, like it's hard to keep up like trends. You never know, like something goes up in there and trending trends will absolutely affect your audience. And so that that kind of is a tough question where it comes to how to balance that, but it's obviously affecting your audience. It all comes down to audience. So if you want to grow your audience and if you really want to put on that more entrepreneurial cap and be like growth and numbers and profit, you follow the trends. If you want to really dive in heavy into like artist integrity and oh, I'm going to do what I want to do and, and just be that artist, I think there's still a lot you can learn from the structures of and the analysis and data analytics from social media. How do you say no to the box? You say no by just refusing to people please. Don't be a people pleaser. Do what inspires you. Do what you feel called to do. Your voice is unique. And nobody else is thinking what you're thinking. Flash four. We have our final segment, our flash four, where we ask all our guests to answer four questions in a flash. So as fast as possible. Are you ready? Okay. I'm going to have to do an extra take, but okay, let's do it. (laughs) If you had to recommend a resource to our audience, what would it be? YouTube. What was the first dance you saw? In college, it was a, no, sorry, high school, high school talent show. Yes. (laughs) Do you think social media has a positive influence on the dance world? Yes or no? Yes and no. Yeah, that's the next trick question for sure. (laughs) (laughs) What is your favorite social media platform? Currently Instagram. TikTok is coming. (laughs) Well, Joel, again, thank you so much for taking the time to be on our show. I really loved having this conversation on air with you. Is there anything you would love to leave our audience with? Follow No Box, follow Mixed Modus. Uh, We are working on some really cool stuff. Uh, Shout out to Marthea, uh, Reina, and Yejin, right? I'm sorry that I pronounced her name right. Yeah, for running and also and Azar. And Azar, excuse me, for just keeping that up. They are really embodying even what I'm saying. Do what you want. Seek that information. Reach out. Don't stop doing your own thing. And just watch. Right? No box is going to get big. So don't sleep on it. <laughs> Thank you, Joel. I appreciate that. And I know everyone on our team well as well. How can our listeners stay connected with you and what you're up to? So you can follow me on Instagram which we can put on there. Thank you. <laughs> it's a uh, jolie.dt. And I think for right now, just to keep an eye out with that. The views will be launching really soon. Social media is the best way to do that right now. And the website will be amusestudio.com. Fabulous. Thank you, Joel. Thank you, Martha. Dance Behind the Screen podcast is produced by Novox Dance, an art service organization that creates, collaborates, and discusses art 
with artists and the public. Dance Behind the Screen podcast is co-hosted by Azaria Hogans, Raina Mondragon, Marthea Nygaard, and Yejin Choi, with sound design by Daniel Rosas. Thanks for taking your time to tune into Dance Behind the Screen, a bi-monthly interview series where we go behind the screen to question process, product, and social media. Be sure to follow us on social media at KNOW Box Dance. See you next time and don't forget to say no to the box.